The Citizen's Almanac, Section 18, Plessy v. Ferguson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Datcher. The Citizen's Almanac, Fundamental Documents, Symbols, and Anthems of the United States by U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Section 18, Plessy v. Ferguson, John Marshall Harlan, Delivering the Dissenting Opinion of the Court, 1896. While great strides were made in establishing the political rights of African Americans following the American Civil War, the U.S. Supreme Court delivered several decisions, most notably in the case of Plessy v. Ferguson, that impeded the civil rights efforts in the United States. Beginning in 1887, following the passage of the first Jim Crow laws in Florida, states began to require that railroads furnish separate accommodations for each race. Jim Crow laws sought to restrict the rights of African Americans. They were named after a popular minstrel character in the 1830s. The laws were unfair, and by this time segregation was extended to most public facilities. Many saw the extension of segregation into railroads as a further objection to the work that Congress and the federal government had done to affirm the rights of African Americans. On June 7, 1892, Homer Plessy, an African American from New Orleans, boarded a train and sat in a rail car for white passengers. A conductor asked him to move, but Plessy refused and was then arrested and charged with violating the Jim Crow Car Act of 1890. Plessy challenged his arrest in court, and the case was tried in New Orleans. He argued that segregation violated both the 13th and 14th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Through appeal, the case was heard before the U.S. Supreme Court in 1896. By an 8-1 decision, the court ruled against Plessy, thus establishing the separate but equal rule. The separate but equal rule mandated separate accommodations for blacks and whites on buses, trains, and in hotels, theaters, and schools. In a powerful dissent, Justice John Marshall Harlan disagreed with the majority, stating, Our Constitution is colorblind, and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. Harlan's words provided inspiration to many involved in the Civil Rights Movement, including Thurgood Marshall, whose arguments in Brown v. Board of Education helped overturn the separate but equal precedent in 1954. Excerpts In respect of civil rights common to all citizens, the Constitution of the United States does not, I think, permit any public authority to know the race of those entitled to be protected in the enjoyment of such rights. In the view of the Constitution, in the eye of the law, there is in this country no superior dominant ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. The humblest is the peer of the most powerful. The law regards man as man and takes no account of his surroundings or of his color when his civil rights as guaranteed by the supreme law of the land are involved end of section 18《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》
that public school students were required to salute the American flag and recite the Pledge of Allegiance regardless of personal religious beliefs. Despite the ruling, many students, including the children of Jehovah's Witnesses, a religious group in the United States, continued to resist saluting the flag and reciting the Pledge of Allegiance due to their religious beliefs. Many of these students were persecuted for their beliefs, and intense pressure forced the Supreme Court to revisit the issue of First Amendment freedoms just three years later. In 1943, the court heard arguments in the case of West Virginia State Board of Education v. Barnett. This case concerned a requirement by the West Virginia Board of Education that all teachers and students must salute the flag as a part of their daily program. Refusal to do so resulted in harsh punishment, including, in some cases, expulsion. After reviewing the arguments on both sides, the court reversed its original ruling in Minersville School District v. Gabitis, stating that this required activity violated the First Amendment. Justice Robert Jackson delivered the decision of the majority, writing that if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodoxed in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. The court's ruling ensured that the right to worship freely, as long as it does not interfere with the rights of others, is protected under the Constitution. Excerpts the very purpose of a Bill of Rights was to withdraw certain subjects from the vicissitudes of political controversy, to place them beyond the reach of majorities and officials, and to establish them as legal principles to be applied by the courts. One's right to life, liberty, and property, to free speech, a free press, freedom of worship and assembly, and other fundamental rights may not be submitted to vote. They depend on the outcome of no elections. If there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. If there are any circumstances which permit an exception, they do not now occur to us. End of section 19. The Citizen's Almanac, section 20, Brown v. Board of Education. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Datcher. The Citizen's Almanac. Fundamental Documents, Symbols, and Anthems of the United States by U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Section 20. Brown v. Board of Education. Earl Warren Delivering the Opinion of the Court. 1954. Since the U.S. Supreme Court's 1896 decision in the case of Plessy v. Ferguson, racially segregated public schools were accepted under the basis of the separate but equal rule. The separate but equal rule mandated separate accommodations for blacks and whites on buses, trains, and in hotels, theaters, and schools. Many civil rights groups, including the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, worked to overturn this ruling for several decades. In 1952, the NAACP brought five cases before the Supreme Court that directly challenged the precedent established in Plessy v. Ferguson. Due to the divided opinion of the court on whether or not it was possible to overturn this ruling, the justices called for additional hearings at a later date. Following several setbacks, including the death of Chief Justice Frederick Vinson, the Supreme Court agreed to hear each case once again during its 1953 term. The five cases brought before the Supreme Court illustrated that many public schools in America were not providing equal facilities and materials to African-American students. Thurgood Marshall, 
the NAACP's lead attorney argued that the separate but equal rule violated the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which granted citizenship to all citizens regardless of color and provided equal protection under the law. On May 17, 1954, Chief Justice Earl Warren delivered the unanimous ruling of the court, stating that the segregation of public schools was in fact a violation of the 14th Amendment and was therefore unconstitutional. The historic decision ended the separate but equal rule that had been in place for nearly six decades. The court's opinion in this landmark case helped expand the civil rights movement in the United States, advancing the idea that every citizen deserves America's promise of equality and justice under the law. Excerpts We come then to the question presented. Does segregation of children in public schools solely on the basis of race, even though the physical facilities and other tangible factors may be equal, deprive the children of the minority group of equal educational opportunities? We believe that it does. To separate them from others of similar age and qualification solely because of their race generates a feeling of inferiority as to their status in the community that may affect their heart and minds in a way unlikely ever to be undone. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. End of section 20「The Citizen's Almanac – Section 21 – Presidential Statements on Citizenship and Immigration – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Citizen's Almanac – Fundamental Documents, Symbols, and Anthems of the United States – by u s department of homeland security section twenty one presidential statements on citizenship and immigration the united states has a long cherished history as a welcoming country and the contributions of immigrants continue to enrich the nation while our citizens come from different backgrounds and cultures americans are bound together by shared ideals based on individual freedom and the rule of law American presidents, beginning with George Washington, have acknowledged the contributions of immigrants and regularly spoken about the importance of responsible citizenship. Speaking on behalf of the United States and its citizens, presidential speeches are often eloquent and endearing, conveying the feelings of the nation. The following section includes a collection of presidential quotes on citizenship and the important contributions of immigrants. As you read, note that throughout history, U.S. presidents have expressed a consistent message on these two themes. George Washington The bosom of America is open to receive not only the opulent and respectable stranger, but the oppressed and persecuted of all nations and religions, whom we shall welcome to a participation of all our rights and privileges, if by decency and propriety of conduct they appear to merit the enjoyment. 1783. Thomas Jefferson. Born in other countries, yet believing you could be happy in this, our laws acknowledge, as they should do, your right to join us in society, conforming, as I doubt not you will do, to our established rules. That these rules shall be as equal as prudential considerations will admit will certainly be the aim of our legislatures general and particular eighteen hundred one abraham lincoln let us at all times remember that all american citizens are brothers of a common country and should dwell together in the bonds of fraternal feeling eighteen sixty ulysses s grant the immigrant is not a citizen of any state or territory upon his arrival but comes here to become a citizen of a great republic free to change his residence at will to enjoy the blessings of a protecting government where all are equal before the law and to add to the national wealth by his industry 
on his arrival he does not know states or corporations but confides implicitly in the protecting arm of the great free country of which he has heard so much before leaving his native land eighteen seventy two the united states wisely freely and liberally offers its citizenship to all who may come in good faith to reside within its limits on their complying with certain prescribed reasonable and simple formalities and conditions among the highest duties of the government is that to afford firm sufficient and equal protection to all its citizens whether native born or naturalized eighteen seventy four grover cleveland heretofore we have welcomed all who came to us from other lands except those whose moral or physical condition or history threatened danger to our national welfare and safety relying upon the zealous watchfulness of our people to prevent injury to our political and social fabric we have encouraged those coming from foreign countries to cast their lot with us and join in the development of our vast domain securing in return a share in the blessings of american citizenship eighteen ninety seven theodore roosevelt the good citizen is the man who whatever his wealth or his poverty strives manfully to do his duty to himself to his family to his neighbor to the state who is incapable of the baseness which manifests itself either in arrogance or in envy but who while demanding justice for himself is no less scrupulous to do justice to others it is because the average citizen rich or poor is of just this type that we have cause for our profound faith in the future of the republic nineteen hundred three we are all of us americans and nothing else we all have equal rights and equal obligations we form part of one people in the face of all other nations paying allegiance only to one flag and a wrong to any one of us is a wrong to all the rest of us nineteen seventeen woodrow wilson this is the only country in the world which experiences this constant and repeated rebirth other countries depend upon the multiplication of their own native people this country is constantly drinking strength out of new sources by the voluntary association with it of great bodies of strong men and forward-looking women out of other lands and so by the gift of the free will of independent people it is being constantly renewed from generation to generation by the same process by which it was originally created you have just taken an oath of allegiance to the united states of allegiance to whom of allegiance to no one unless it is god certainly not of allegiance to those who temporarily represent this great government you have taken an oath of allegiance to a great ideal to a great body of principles to a great hope of the human race nineteen fifteen we came to america either ourselves or in the persons of our ancestors to better the ideals of men to make them see finer things than they had seen before to get rid of the things that divide and to make sure of the things that unite nineteen fifteen warren g harding nothing is more important to america than citizenship there is more assurance of our future in the individual character of our citizens than in any proposal i and all the wise advisers i can gather can ever put into effect in washington nineteen twenty calvin coolidge american citizenship is a high estate he who holds it is the peer of kings it has been secured only by untold toil and effort it will be maintained by no other method it demands the best that men and women have to give but it likewise awards its partakers the best that there is on earth nineteen twenty four whether one traces his americanism back three centuries to the mayflower or three years to the steerage is not half so important as whether his americanism of today is real and genuine no matter by what various crafts we came here we are all now in the same boat nineteen twenty five franklin d roosevelt the principle on which this country was founded and by which it has always been governed is that americanism is a matter of the mind and heart 
americanism is not and never was a matter of race and ancestry a good american is one who is loyal to this country and to our creed of liberty and democracy 1943 harry s truman there is no more precious possession today than united states citizenship a nation is no stronger than its citizenry with many problems facing us daily in this perplexing and trying era it is vital that we have a unity of purpose to the end that freedom justice and opportunity goodwill and happiness may be assured ourselves and peoples everywhere nineteen forty eight john f kennedy everywhere immigrants have enriched and strengthened the fabric of american life nineteen fifty nine lyndon b johnson our citizens naturalized or native born must also seek to refresh and improve their knowledge of how our government operates under the constitution and how they can participate in it only in this way can they assume the full responsibilities of citizenship and make our government more truly of by and for the people nineteen sixty seven ronald reagan it's long been my belief that america is a chosen place a rich and fertile continent placed by some divine providence here between the two great oceans and only those who really wanted to get here would get here only those who most yearn for freedom would make the terrible trek that it took to get here america has drawn the stoutest hearts from every corner of the world from every nation of the world and that was lucky for america because if it was going to endure and grow and protect its freedoms for two hundred years it was going to need stout hearts nineteen eighty four i received a letter just before i left office from a man i don't know why he chose to write it but i'm glad he did he wrote that you can go to live in france but you can't become a frenchman you can go to live in germany or italy but you can't become a german an italian he went through turkey greece japan and other countries but he said anyone from any corner of the world can come to live in the united states and become an american nineteen ninety george h w bush nearly all americans have ancestors who brave the oceans liberty-loving risk-takers in search of an ideal the largest voluntary migrations in recorded history across the pacific across the atlantic they came from every point on the compass many passing beneath the statue of liberty with fear and vision with sorrow and adventure fleeing tyranny or terror seeking haven and all-seeking hope immigration is not just a link to america's past it's also a bridge to america's future nineteen ninety william j clinton more than any other nation on earth america has constantly drawn strength and spirit from wave after wave of immigrants in each generation they have proved to be the most restless the most adventurous the most innovative the most industrious of people bearing different memories honoring different heritages they have strengthened our economy enriched our culture renewed our promise of freedom and opportunity for all and together immigrants and citizens alike let me say we must recommit ourselves to the general duties of citizenship not just immigrants but every american should know what's in our constitution and understand our shared history not just immigrants but every american should participate in our democracy by voting by volunteering and by running for office not just immigrants but every american on our campuses and in our communities should serve community service breeds good citizenship and not just immigrants but every american should reject identity politics that seeks to separate us not bring us together nineteen ninety eight george w bush america has never been united by blood or birth or soil we are bound by ideals that move us beyond our backgrounds lift us above our interests and teach us what it means to be citizens every child must be taught these principles every citizen must uphold them and every immigrant by embracing these ideals makes our country more not less american two thousand one america's welcoming society is more than a cultural tradition 
it is a fundamental promise of our democracy our constitution does not limit citizenship by background or birth instead our nation is bound together by a shared love of liberty and a conviction that all people are created with dignity and value through the generations americans have upheld that vision by welcoming new citizens from across the globe and that has made us stand apart two thousand six end of section twenty one the citizens almanac section twenty two prominent foreign-born americans this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the citizens almanac fundamental documents symbols and anthems of the united states by u s department of homeland security section twenty two prominent foreign-born americans throughout our nation's history foreign-born men and women have come to the united states taken the oath of allegiance and contributed greatly to their new communities and country the united states welcomes individuals from nations near and far and immigrants have played an important role in establishing this country as the land of opportunity america takes great pride in being known as a nation of immigrants the following section provides examples of individuals who have come to the united states become citizens by choice and left a lasting impression on our society this list is by no means all-encompassing as a comprehensive record would be nearly impossible instead it serves the purpose of highlighting a selection of foreign-born americans coming from a wide range of countries who have had a significant impact on the united states as we know it today john paul jones seventeen forty seven to seventeen ninety two american naval officer john paul was born july sixth seventeen forty seven in kirkbean kirkcudbrightshire scotland now dumfries and galloway scotland at age twenty one he commanded his first ship and quickly became a very successful merchant skipper in the west indies in the mid seventeen seventies he moved to the british colonies in north america adopting the last name jones at the beginning of the american revolution he joined the continental navy and was commissioned first lieutenant during the war jones commanded several vessels including the duc de dura which he renamed bonhomme richard in honor of benjamin franklin's poor richard's almanac aboard this ship on september twenty third seventeen seventy nine jones engaged the british vessel h m s serapis off the coast of england jones defeated the h m s serapis in one of the most storied battles in united states naval history he is now entombed beneath the chapel of the u s naval academy in annapolis maryland alexander hamilton seventeen fifty seven to eighteen hundred four first secretary of the treasury serving under president george washington hamilton was born january eleventh seventeen fifty seven on the island of nevis british west indies now part of the independent country of st kitts and nevis hamilton moved to america in seventeen seventy two where he attended preparatory school in elizabethtown new jersey at the outbreak of the american revolution in seventeen seventy six hamilton entered the continental army in new york as captain of artillery in seventeen seventy seven he was appointed aide-de-camp to general george washington hamilton was one of three men responsible for the federalist papers and was the guiding spirit behind the adoption of the u s constitution with the adoption of the constitution in seventeen eighty seven hamilton like all other residents of the new nation became an original founding citizen of the united states he was also a founder and leader of the first political party in the united states the federalists william a leidesdorf eighteen ten to eighteen forty eight american business man and first african-american diplomat leidesdorf was born in the danish west indies now the u s virgin islands to a danish man and an african woman 
in eighteen ten he was raised by a wealthy english plantation owner and obtained a formal education while in the danish west indies upon his caretaker's untimely death he moved to the united states settling in new orleans louisiana he became a naturalized u s citizen in eighteen thirty four leidesdorf became active in the mercantile industry and soon developed a trade route between yerba buena now san francisco california and honolulu hawaii in eighteen forty four while living in california then part of mexico he became a mexican citizen in order to increase his land holdings on october twenty ninth eighteen forty five thomas o larkin u s consul in monterey california appointed leidesdorf as vice consul at yerba buena leidesdorf secretly helped the united states annex the region of california his service as vice consul lasted until the u s occupation of northern california in july eighteen forty six alexander graham bell eighteen forty seven to nineteen twenty two american inventor introduced the telephone in eighteen seventy six bell was born march third eighteen forty seven in edinburgh scotland in eighteen seventy two he moved to the united states where he taught at boston university bell became a naturalized u s citizen in eighteen eighty two at an early age he was fascinated with the idea of transmitting speech while working with his assistant thomas watson in boston bell shared his idea of what would become the telephone in eighteen seventy six bell introduced the telephone to the world at the centennial exposition in philadelphia pennsylvania the invention of the telephone led to the organization of the bell telephone company bell was also responsible for inventing the photophone in eighteen eighty an instrument that transmitted speech by light rays in addition he was a co-founder of the national geographic society and served as its president from eighteen ninety eight to nineteen hundred four joseph pulitzer eighteen forty seven to nineteen eleven american newspaper publisher pulitzer was born april tenth eighteen forty seven in mako hungary he immigrated to the united states in eighteen sixty four to serve in the american civil war joining the first new york cavalry pulitzer began his newspaper career as an employee of a german language daily in st louis missouri he became a naturalized u s citizen in eighteen sixty seven after buying two st louis newspapers and merging them into the successful st louis post dispatch in eighteen seventy eight pulitzer purchased the new york world in eighteen eighty three he shifted the newspaper's focus toward human interest stories scandals and fighting corruption as the world's circulation grew from fifteen thousand to six hundred thousand the largest in the united states before his death in nineteen eleven pulitzer pledged money to set up a school of journalism at columbia university in new york as well as the pulitzer prizes for journalists the pulitzer prizes are now considered the most prestigious awards in print journalism francis x cabrini eighteen fifty to nineteen seventeen american humanitarian and social worker first u s citizen to be canonized by the catholic church cabrini was born july fifteenth eighteen fifty in sant'angelo lodigiano italy after taking vows to become a nun in eighteen seventy seven she began teaching at an orphanage in codogno italy in eighteen eighty nine pope leo the thirteenth sent her to new york to begin ministering to the growing number of new immigrants in the united states she became a naturalized u s citizen in nineteen hundred nine throughout her lifetime cabrini worked with all those in need including the poor the uneducated and the sick she helped organize schools orphanages and adult education classes for immigrants in her nearly forty years of ministry in nineteen forty six pope pius the twelfth canonized her making her the first u s citizen to be canonized cabrini is now the catholic church's patron saint of immigrants michael pupin eighteen fifty eight to nineteen thirty five american physicist and inventor pupin was born october fourth eighteen fifty eight 
in idvor austria hungary now serbia in eighteen seventy four he moved to the united states settling in new york pupin graduated from columbia university with a degree in physics in eighteen eighty three he became a naturalized u s citizen that same year in eighteen eighty nine pupin obtained his doctorate from the university of berlin upon graduation he returned to columbia university where he taught for more than forty years pupin was well known for his improvement of long-distance telephone and telegraph communication throughout his career he received thirty-four patents for his inventions in nineteen twenty four he won the pulitzer prize for his autobiography from immigrant to inventor solomon carter fuller eighteen seventy two to nineteen fifty three american psychiatrist first known african-american psychiatrist in the united states fuller was born in monrovia liberia in eighteen seventy two in eighteen eighty nine he moved to the united states to attend livingston college in salisbury north carolina he received his m d from boston university's school of medicine in eighteen ninety four and began teaching there in eighteen ninety nine fuller spent a year in munich germany studying psychiatry much of his research centered on degenerative brain diseases including alzheimer's disease which he attributed to causes other than arteriosclerosis a theory that was fully supported by medical researchers in nineteen fifty three fuller became a naturalized u s citizen in nineteen twenty albert einstein eighteen seventy nine to nineteen fifty five american scientist and nobel laureate in physics widely considered to be the greatest scientist of the twentieth century einstein was born march fourteenth eighteen seventy nine at ulm in wertemberg germany in nineteen twenty one he received the nobel prize in physics for his discovery of the law of the photoelectric effect einstein's special theory of relativity containing the famous equation e equals m c squared also won him international praise when the nazis came to power in germany in nineteen thirty three he immigrated to the united states and joined the newly formed institute for advanced studies at princeton university einstein became a naturalized u s citizen in nineteen forty igor stravinsky eighteen eighty two to nineteen seventy one american composer stravinsky was born june seventeenth eighteen eighty two in oranium baum russia now lomonosov russia his early career was spent composing in switzerland and paris france stravinsky's works include the rite of spring nineteen thirteen the soldier's tale nineteen eighteen oedipus rex nineteen twenty seven and persephone nineteen thirty four in nineteen thirty nine he left europe and settled in the united states stravinsky became a naturalized u s citizen in nineteen forty five the various styles of music he experimented with made stravinsky one of the most influential composers of his time he is now widely regarded as one of the greatest composers of the twentieth century felix frankfurter eighteen eighty two to nineteen sixty five american legal scholar and u s supreme court justice frankfurter was born november fifteenth eighteen eighty two in vienna austria hungary now austria in eighteen ninety four he immigrated to the united states and attended both city college of new york and harvard law school by virtue of his father's naturalization frankfurter became a naturalized u s citizen he went on to serve as an assistant u s attorney in new york state nineteen hundred six to nineteen ten and a legal officer in the bureau of insular affairs nineteen eleven to nineteen fourteen from nineteen fourteen to nineteen thirty nine frankfurter was a professor at harvard law school in nineteen thirty nine president franklin d roosevelt appointed him an associate justice to the u s supreme court newt rockney eighteen eighty eight to nineteen thirty one american football player and coach rockney was born march fourth eighteen eighty eight in voss norway his father brought the family to the united states in eighteen ninety three by virtue of his father's naturalization rockney became a naturalized u s citizen 
in eighteen ninety six as the head football coach of the university of notre dame from nineteen eighteen to nineteen thirty he achieved the greatest winning percentage of all time at point eight eight one per cent during his years as head coach rotney collected one hundred five victories twelve losses five ties and six national championships he also coached notre dame to five undefeated seasons both as a player and a coach rotney popularized the use of the forward pass which significantly changed how the game was played irving berlin eighteen eighty eight to nineteen eighty nine american composer and songwriter berlin was born may eleventh eighteen eighty eight in mogilov russia now belarus in eighteen ninety three his family emigrated to the united states he became a naturalized u s citizen in nineteen eighteen berlin wrote music and lyrics for broadway shows such as annie get your gun nineteen forty six and miss liberty nineteen forty nine as well as for films such as holiday inn nineteen forty two blue skies nineteen forty six and easter parade nineteen forty eight he also wrote popular songs such as there's no business like show business god bless america and the holiday classic white christmas in nineteen fifty five president dwight t eisenhower recognized berlin's patriotic songs by presenting him with a special medal authorized by the u s congress in nineteen eighty six berlin was one of twelve naturalized u s citizens to receive the medal of liberty from president ronald reagan frank capra eighteen ninety seven to nineteen ninety one american film director and producer capra was born may eighteenth eighteen ninety seven in palermo italy in nineteen hundred three his family emigrated to the united states settling in los angeles he became a naturalized u s citizen in nineteen twenty capra is known for directing such films as mr smith goes to washington nineteen thirty nine it's a wonderful life nineteen forty six and mr deeds goes to town nineteen thirty six for which he won the academy award for best director although it was considered a box office failure upon its release his nineteen forty six film it's a wonderful life has become one of the most beloved holiday films of all times dalip singh sond eighteen ninety nine to nineteen seventy three american congressman and first asian american to serve in the u s congress sond was born september twentieth eighteen ninety nine in chajulwadi punjab india he graduated from the university of punjab in nineteen nineteen and moved to the united states the following year to attend the university of california sond earned both a master's degree and a doctorate from the university of california he then became a successful lettuce farmer in the imperial valley of california he became a naturalized u s citizen in nineteen forty nine in nineteen fifty two sond was elected judge of justice court for the westmoreland judicial district in california's imperial county a position he was denied two years earlier because he had not been a u s citizen for more than a year in nineteen fifty six he was elected to represent the twenty ninth congressional district of california in the u s house of representatives becoming the first asian american to serve in the u s congress marlena dietrich nineteen hundred one to nineteen ninety two american actress and singer dietrich was born december seventh nineteen hundred one in berlin germany she began her acting career in berlin where she quickly became popular in the theatre and in silent films in nineteen twenty nine she was cast in the film the blue angel nineteen thirty by american director joseph von sternberg her performance was widely acclaimed and dietrich promptly moved to the united states she starred in a variety of films during her career including morocco nineteen thirty the devil is a woman nineteen thirty five desire nineteen thirty six and judgment at nuremberg nineteen sixty one she became a naturalized u s citizen in nineteen thirty nine during world war two dietrich made over five hundred appearances before american troops overseas bob hope nineteen hundred three to two thousand three american entertainer hope was born may twenty ninth nineteen hundred three in eltham great britain 
in nineteen hundred seven his father moved the family to cleveland ohio in nineteen twenty by virtue of his father's naturalization bob the name he took for the rest of his life became a u s citizen throughout his career he appeared in a variety of films and television specials and performed many shows for american troops overseas including world war ii nineteen thirty nine to nineteen forty five the korean war nineteen fifty to nineteen fifty three the vietnam war nineteen fifty nine to nineteen seventy five and the persian gulf war nineteen ninety one in nineteen ninety seven president william clinton named him an honorary military veteran subramanian chandrasekhar nineteen ten to nineteen ninety five american scientist and nobel laureate chandrasekhar was born october nineteenth nineteen ten in lahore india now pakistan he earned a bachelor's degree in physics at presidency college in madras india and a doctorate from trinity college in england chandrasekhar immigrated to the united states in nineteen thirty seven where he joined the faculty of the university of chicago he became a naturalized u s citizen in nineteen fifty three chandrasekhar was the first to theorize that not all stars end up as white dwarf stars but those retaining mass above a certain limit known today as chandrasekhar's limit undergo further collapse in nineteen eighty three he was awarded the nobel prize in physics for his theoretical studies of the physical processes important to the structure and evolution of stars in nineteen ninety nine the national aeronautics and space administration nasa named one of its four great observatories orbiting the earth in space for chandrasekhar kenneth b clark nineteen fourteen to two thousand five american psychologist clark was born july fourteenth nineteen fourteen in the panama canal zone in nineteen nineteen he moved to the united states settling in new york with his mother and sister he became a naturalized u s citizen in nineteen thirty one clark obtained a bachelor's degree from howard university in nineteen thirty five and a master's degree in nineteen thirty six he went on to earn a doctorate in experimental psychology from columbia university in nineteen forty becoming the first african-american to earn a doctorate in psychology at the school in nineteen forty six he and his wife mamie founded the north side center for child development in harlem new york where they began conducting research on racial bias in education a nineteen fifty report from clark on racial discrimination was cited in the landmark brown v board of education supreme court decision which ruled public school segregation unconstitutional clark was also the first african-american to serve as president of the american psychological association in nineteen eighty six he was one of twelve naturalized u s citizens to receive the medal of liberty from president ronald reagan celia cruz nineteen twenty five to two thousand three american singer known as the queen of salsa cruz was born october twenty first nineteen twenty five in havana cuba she became famous in cuba in the nineteen fifties singing with the band la sonora matancera cruz left cuba for the united states in nineteen sixty after fidel castro came to power she was soon headlining the hollywood palladium in california and carnegie hall in new york cruz became a naturalized u s citizen in nineteen sixty one she appeared in several films including the mambo kings nineteen ninety two and the perez family nineteen ninety five and sang a duet with david byrne for the nineteen eighty six film something wild during her long career cruz received a smithsonian lifetime achievement award a national medal of the arts and honorary doctorates from yale university and the university of miami End of section 22「The Citizen's Almanac – Section 23 – Acknowledgements – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Citizen's Almanac – Fundamental Documents – 
symbols and anthems of the united states by u s department of homeland security section twenty three acknowledgments u s citizenship and immigration services and the office of citizenship would like to extend its appreciation to the following organizations for their support and assistance in the development of this publication center for civic education www.civiced.org national endowment for the humanities www.neh.gov national constitution center www.constitutioncenter.org uscis historical reference library www.uscis.gov marilyn zoidis formerly senior curator star-spangled banner project smithsonian institutions national museum of american history americanhistory.si.edu national endowment for the humanities our nation is not bound together by common ties of blood race or religion we are united instead by our devotion to shared ideals so each generation of americans both native-born and immigrants must learn our great founding principles how our institutions came into being how they work and what our rights and responsibilities are for this reason the national endowment for the humanities is proud to support the development of the citizens almanac this valuable resource will help new americans become educated and thoughtful citizens who can fully participate in our government of by and for the people bruce cole chairman national endowment for the humanities end of section twenty three End of The Citizens' Almanac, Fundamental Documents, Symbols, and Anthems of the United States by U.S. Department of Homeland Security.